I thank you. And uh, this is the first time I've done a Zoom meeting. I've done plenty of talks, but this is the first one. So bear with me. This first picture is a picture of a thing that the uh, a diorama that the New York State Museum has. It portrays a mother mastodon with her calf actually in Orange County. If you look in the background, you'll see Storm King Mountain below and behind her would be where uh, Cornwall is today. And I wanna thank them for the use of this picture. Often asked what the area looked like post glaciation and at the time that the mastodon were walking about in our area. This is a picture taken up in Labrador, but it shows exactly what Orange County and surrounding counties would have looked like at that point in time. We have trees, mastodon or browsers, they need to have trees. We have open steps, so to speak, and ponds and bogs all over. This one's kind of interesting. This picture is a bog and it has the sedge or the tussock grass, if you will, is of the same variety that the mastodon ate and that we still have in Orange County in places. Um, I just wanted to let you all see that. I'll start off, uh, this is what we believe is a mastodon footprint. You can see how it's been, the marl, which is the bottom of a pond or a lake, um, has been forced down, that's the orangish color, has been forced down into the blue-gray clay. Above it, you see the peat or the black dirt um, that came in once that lake was drained and became marsh. This is another footprint, we believe. Um, these are very, very rare. So it's exciting to have these. These are now gone, um, washed out, but uh, they were there. Get into some of the mastodon that we have that have been excavated in Orange County. This one happens to be sugar. Um, it's known as sugar because it was found at Sugarloaf, New York. And this was excavated by the Orange County chapter of the New York State Archaeological Association and um, was basically intact. It's a, a, a nice specimen. This can be seen at SUNY Orange or the Orange County Community College that we used to call it OCK. Um, and it can be seen today. This is another mastodon that was found in, in 1952 um, and was found in Harriman, New York and it's called Harry. And this is at the, at the Museum, of, uh, Museum Village in Monroe, New York. Uh, and it was a very complete mastodon when excavated and, and it is in their natural history building. This is the Warren Mastodon, which was found near Montgomery, New York uh, in 1842. And this is at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. This is the thing from the museum itself. Um, you can see the size of this thing, it's huge. And this is another picture. This is a picture I took of that Mastodon skeleton and uh, one of many that was found in New York. And before I get to this, I'll just mention some of the others that were found. Many, many mastodon were found in the early, early years. Um, and in actuality, uh, General Washington, when he was at the cantonment prior to him becoming president, saw big bones, and that was what he called them in local farms uh, in their, they, they'd be digging the marl and they would burn the marl and put it on their fields much the same way we do uh, lime today. It sweetens the soil. And uh, the, in, in those pits, they would find mastodon bones and those where they would put in their barn and then charge people a penny to see them. And uh, even Washington saw those. So when uh, 
he told Jefferson and later become President Jefferson. And he was told by the French that there was nothing special about in the Americas and uh, everything was little. And, but Jefferson remembered what Washington had said and sent Peel um, to New York State, to Orange County, to investigate and to try to find the bones. And if he could find the bones, maybe he could find the mastodon himself or didn't, was a mastodon. Um, but Peel came back with a skeleton, uh, a partial skeleton, and a piece of another one was used as well. And that stayed in his museums for years and years, and then was exported to Germany, to Darmstadt. Um, and I actually talked to the director of the Darmstadt Museum years ago, and has now come back and is at the Smithsonian Museum. I have not been down to see it, but it is there. So the Peel, Museum, Peel Mastodon is there. And because of Peel's uh, capability of identifying things and the careful way he extracted it, he became known as the father of vertebrate paleontology in New York and uh, America. And so the birthplace of vertebrate paleontology in America is actually Newburgh, New York. So that's that. This is a tusk sticking out of the Wallkill River. Uh, brush has been pulled away. You can see where the brush has been pulled away. And the stake is for size. And uh, this was found by my son, actually, and a friend um, as they went down the Wallkill River in their canoe. This was in November of 2008. And uh, they, had, they were both archaeologists. And Chris Canallan and, and Glenn were working down at the Delaware Water Gap and they came up. I tried to talk them out of going down Wallkill because it, the water temperature was sub a sub 40 degrees. And I told them they ought to go to the bash at Kill that was flat water. And they said, well, there's no moral. And I knew what they were looking for. And so this is what they saw as they were going down the Wallkill River. And this is a close up of it. This is the tusk sticking out uh, as it was found. This was the next day I took this picture and uh, you can see again, the closer view. And an end view, you can see how it almost looks like a log, but it's not mastodon tusk. So excavation of this could not start. The landowner owns the mastodon. He owns the land, therefore anything that's on that land is his. That includes arrowheads or whatever. So if you happen to be walking on a farmer's field and see an arrowhead, by law, you have to get a written permission to take that uh, because it belongs to the landowner. But in this case, uh, it was donated to the New York State Museum and um, thank the landowner for that. And as per request, Glenn is doing plastic casting the outside of it to protect that from elements. And when you do that, you want to put a tin foil over the top because you don't want the saturation of the chemicals into that husk. Here's what it looks like when it's finished. In the end, this did not work. Uh, chunks of ice charging down that river is at meltwater, uh, just tore it up. So the next spring in May, I had been doing a program uh, and walk at the uh, paleo site. Um, at Duchess Quarry Caves and came back by to check on that site and found that there was another one. And this is the end of the second tusk. And it was complete. And this is the very, very end of the pulp, what they call the pulp cavity. This is the farthest that goes into the mouth. And there's sort of cone there that develops tusk. So we have a whole one. And this is the old tusk that had been broken off by Ice. And it looked, this is a good example of the cross section of a mastodon tusk. Here's a New York State employee taking photos of the new tusk and the old tusk out of canoe. I took this picture. 
And here are department heads from the New York State Museum and a staff member, the person in the yellowish hat with pink shirt is Don Lothrop and he is the head of prehistoric archaeology. The next one is uh, Andy Kozlowski. He is a geologist and the other one with the blue shirt and the blue hat is Bob Ferranik and he is uh, head of the Department of Vertebrate Paleontology and Mammals. And this is at the site. So they're doing ground penetrating radar here. We see Andy running his transit along. A little iffy there because uh, that's right where the undercut of the bank is, but they had to take that section there. And you, each line is part of the center line. This is a larger unit of the ground penetrating radar. And um, on the right, Andy is holding the uh, monitor and they're running that along the transit. And they're looking at the monitor here. Um, and this is what the monitor looks like. And Andy had trained for seven years at that point in discerning exactly what each one of those little lump bumps means uh, on that radar screen and he the only person i know that can actually identify mastodon uh remains via a ground penetrating radar and he's very good this is what a site looks like as you're bringing in the equipment to do this a dig uh, this is the only truck that could get in it has a high clearance so the museum vehicles are all out uh, at a parking area, and this was what brought everything in, so multi-trips. So they're digging, beginning to dig the hole, and the uh, overburden is taken off with a machine. Um, the fellow leaning on the shovel is uh, the landowner, and that's uh, kind of kind of nice to have him there. Uh, as I said, he donated the mastodon to the museum. And here we see the machine is no longer being used to take the, the dig material, but to the shoveled material is put into the bucket to be taken out. And you can see one corner is squared off. Uh, the others will be later. And here they find something very exciting. Uh, Andy's looking on with a cowboy hat and Glenn, my son, uh, is in the hard hat. They're excavating around a piece of white spruce that had sunk in the lake. The last thing to sink prior to the catastrophic loss of water. So dating that was imperative. It gives us a date for when that water left. Uh, you got to remember the black dirt area of Orange County is 25 square miles. So it was a massive, massive area. And it was had been a lake and um, post-glacial lake and it let go. And so this, this piece of wood was resting directly on the marl, which is the bottom of a lake or a pond. And the black dirt, which is generated when it's a bog is from the sides on up. So this literally was the very last thing to uh, sink prior to the catastrophic loss of water. And you may see a black shiny thing. That is not a piece of plastic. That is a carapace from a water beetle that this piece of marl, and you can see the sedge and various and sundry other organics in it, is at least 11,500 years old. So it, that's really, really kind of cool to see what was in that water. Um, moving on, we see the two tusks together. We can see the upper one on the right uh, broken off by the chunks of ice. And the bottom one is intact and whole. Beginning to work around those so we can put a, a cap on them uh, to, to work it out. Here, 
um, uh, Frannick is holding his hand where directly above where the mastodon tusk come out on the river. They've cut down to the marl so they know they're not at the tusk level. And then you'll see at the bottom of the picture uh, an iron rod and Glenn pointing. And this is being shoved through that core of earth. And from that, a, the, the direction, how, you know, what the, the angle is and how, how, what, how many inches it is to, uh, to the tusks. And here you see me in the canoe and Chris Canallan working on the larger of the two tusks. We can see how it's broken apart, um, but basically intact. And here they are trying to figure out exactly how to do this. And we see Glenn standing, Bob Frannick kneeling with the red shirt and Chris Canallan squatting, um, working out exactly how they're going to excavate this thing. And here we see Chris working on the mastodon tusk. We can see the break there. There were literally several thousand pieces of tusk in that little core section. Uh, just the weight of, of six and a half foot of, of black dirt or, or peat on top and crushed it. And here we see Bob very happy with the two tusks. Again, you can see the breakage. And here, Lester Lane, the landowner, Chris Canallan on the right, and Glenn on the left with the two tusks. And here we see the tusk, the long tusk. It was the second largest tusk ever found in New York State. And here we see it plunging, coming in and then plunging straight down into the clay. Um, very interesting. And by the by, it was the, uh, the, the oldest known mastodon ever found in New York State at 14,500 years ago. Um, and that is calibrated years post. And here we see fragments from that tusk. And here Gay Malin, who does, or at that point, did all of the reconstructive work and display units uh, at the New York State Museum holding a piece of tusk. Probably the best thing you'll ever see um, of the what a piece of tusk, outside piece of tusk really looks like. And just it, it's ex exceptional. And here they are doing the plastic casting, you note that there's wood bracing that is to stabilize that tusk when it's being lifted out. Um, and Gay Malin has got the bucket and working a piece of, and then we yeah, have Bob Franny. Well, here Gay Malin is working on a piece of plaster and Glenn is working down to get 18 inch section of the end of the tusk out of the ground. And here he is with that piece of tusk. And he told me that the, the individual grains of sand had scratched the end of the tusk where the last time it was digging into the ground for tubers or roots or whatever uh, had left these tiny little scratches. Well, it was just amazing. And here they are lifting the larger of the two tusks out. It's not a light thing, it weighs about 300 pounds. And here they are lifting that out. That's minus the 18 inch end, but you can see it takes quite a few people to do this. This is the smaller of the two tusks. Well, probably the same disc, same length, but had been ripped apart by the, the winter ice. Notice that it has a very strange curl to it. So not like the other one. And here you can see them putting the tin foil on it that is so that the plaster does not in, seep into the, the tusk itself and leave that chemistry in it. And then over the top of that will be plaster casting. And here again, Glenn is with the 18 inch section with Bob standing behind. This is about 12 o'clock at night after the tusks had been excavated. Crew is 
after several days of hard, hard work, uh, exuberant, albeit quite late, um, and it's raining, but they had finished and was ready to be taken out. The next day, they're being loaded into the truck to go to the museum vehicles. And here they are being put into that truck. This is Mary Egan. Um, she was with a state university down in New Jersey at the time, but was doing uh, collecting samples for Guy Robinson to do pollen analysis. And her, her helper is um, Alex York. And they were taking samples for every three inches from the top down. And you have to remember that the the black dirt at that section, 2000 years had been erased from the top and that's from brown fires and poor farming practices and river wash and whatnot. But uh, you get a, a true sample of the botanical thing so the, of the entire, going all the way back to glacial period. And uh, it's nice to know exactly what was growing in that area from the very beginning. And here we see Bob taking a sample for the museum. And here, John Lothrop is, is logging everything and everything in a fig like this has to be logged. Uh, and in the background, you see Bob and on the right, uh, a museum employee taking a sample. Any paleontological or archeological dig has to be brought back to what it looked like before. And then we had a big hole here. So it, it takes quite a bit of time and effort to fill it. And uh, Lester Lane, the landowner, was quite nice and brought down his tractor and dump uh, to, to help us fill this hole. After the hole was filled, everybody all was happy. And this is after it was complete and it was the straw had been put over for mulch, it had been seeded. And Lester told me a month later that uh, poison ivy was growing fine, had a beautiful set of, of stinging nettles growing up and the sod was coming in nice. So he was quite happy with it. And we don't think that many people will come in and mess with it <laughs> with that poison ivy and stinging nettle. And here we're leaving the site uh, and multiple trips with the truck. And here the tusks are being loaded into the museum vehicle. Um, we have Gay Mail and Glenn and, and Chris. And here leaving the site, going out to a main road, um, a whole trail of, of vehicles, this one and, and museum vehicles and various and sundry others. This is at the lab at New York State Museum. Um, the woman with her hands on her hips is the person that was doing the restoration work at the lab. And here we see Bob showing the section of tusks that still remain in fairly good shape. You'll see bits and pieces of tusk fragments that have to be put back together. Three-dimensional puzzle, it, tremendously hard and it's that I just don't think all of it has been put back together yet and it's been since 2009 so it takes a long long time and here Glenn is looking at the long tusk and people think of tusks as being ivory and that they can be sold and they're worth a ton of money they forget that in the states we don't have permafrost uh it doesn't stay as a uh, set temperature year round. We have drying and, and wet. We have freezing and thawing every year for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And they just they get beat up. <laughs> this is the end of the long tusk that has been stabilized. And this is the smaller of the two tusks and you can see the job that is at hand each one of those pieces has to go back exactly the right spot. So it takes time. And here again, this is a little further along uh, in the restoration work. And we saw the tusk end where the ice had broken it off. And I said it was a good view of a 
diameter of the tusk, uh, cross section of a tusk, and here we see it again. And you can't really see it well, but there are growth lines on this tusk, much the same as you would have in a tree. And at any part of that tusk, if you were to count the rings in from the outer core to the very center, you would know how old or how long it took for that section to grow. Here's the tip of that tusk. Uh, and we see the, the scratches on it. And we can see also growth lines on it um, and how it'd been worn down digging. Now we're at another mastodon. And this one may be even as interesting as the Tunkamoose mastodon. Um, this is the Bowser Road site mastodon. And this was a drainage ditch that hit bone. And the owner of the land, Felix Gonzalez, contacted us and I brought in New York State Museum to look at it and couldn't get an agreement with him. So this went on the auction block uh, for the right to dig and we thought it was lost. But here we see uh, New York State Museum staff and you, you can recognize several of them. Uh, and Gonzalez and his two daughters. I'm, I'm watching a Zoom. And here we have Glenn at this point was working for the American Museum of Natural History and took a day off to come up and help us identify exactly where the mastodon was within this ditch and what parts were where and whether the which side of the ditch would be, you know, have most uh, substantial parts. And this was in the spoil pile where the bucket loader had dumped out pieces of mastodon bone as well as spoil from the ditch. And here we see a piece of bone um, in the spoil pile. And this is a piece of rib. And the lower jaw had come up. And that was kind of fun because look at the wear of these teeth. This was the last set of teeth. A mastodon only have three tech sets and they lose them over a period of time. And the last set, when they're worn out, that mastodon dies. It dies of starvation because it can no longer eat. And this wasn't far behind that. Uh, and we can see by the wear on this. But you note the big, pumps in that tooth is for browsing. It's, it's for eating timber. And if you were to look at a mammoth tooth, it's much, much flatter. It has lateral lines running across it that are no more than an inch, half an inch high. These are much, much more. So this was from the spoil pile. And we helped Felix get as much in as we could. This is one of the teeth. So we got out there, it was bought, it was bought by a consortium, the, the right to dig it was bought by a consortium um, that consisted of um, Mr. Gramley, uh, Mike Gramley, R.M. Gramley, uh, he's an archeologist and um, Dennis Vesper who is, or was on the board at Big Bone Lake in Kentucky, and I believe on the board of the um, Kentucky Board of, of Preservation. Uh, got lucky, <laughs> bought by people that would uh, care for it. But here's an interesting thing. If you look, you'll see how the tusk has been rotted away or eaten away where it comes up to the black dirt or the peat. Peat is full of acids and the acids over thousands of years have just literally eaten that tusk away. Where it is down in the marl and down into the clay, it is in fine shape. Um, marl is, like I said, a sediment at the bottom of a lake or a pond. And that sediment has a lot of calcium carbonate in it. And so preservation is good. 
Here we see ribs. We see a string running through it. And uh, that string is the edge up from one unit to another. And of course, in archaeology, the archaeology doesn't necessarily want to be exactly where one would hope it would be. So if you dig a unit and you often have things running into the edge of that unit, in this case, it's a bone, it's a rib. And here we see Dennis Vesper um, sitting on the corner. Glenn has taken another day off from uh, New York State, or the uh, American Museum of Natural History in New York City, and is working in the, what was once a ditch. Here he is with the tusk. And again, you can see where that tusk has just been eaten away and how flat that line is from where the black dirt or the peat and the marl below it were. And we see tusk spine below it and, and go on. Um, here's what most archeological digs, if you're looking for mastodon are like, they happen to be in wet areas and in the middle of the summer with the Phragmites and that's the reeds in the background high and, and blocking wind, it gets brutally hot. So you have the tents set up to shade. And we see here the edge of a the ditch and a unit. And here we have rib bones, mostly rib bones. I, I see carpal bone in there as well, right at the bottom. And uh, these will be logged out, photographed, uh, drawn in and uh, then ex ex pulled out and numbered so that we know exactly where each piece came from. Uh, Jerry Sipla on the left and Glenn lifting out one third of the tusk. Uh, Jerry Sipla is a member of the Orange County Archaeological Association, so is Glenn, and I am as well. And here Gary Sipola is with that tusk, that third of that tusk in the end. And here we see the end of that tusk and we see how it again flattened out from digging tubers and, and roots and whatnot. And this is a better picture. You can see the water coming down, washing this thing off. But if you look closely, you'll see long horizontal lines running down the, the tusk. Those are all fractures. And if this were to dry out, it would just fall apart. What a beautiful is it when it's waterlogged. You can see we're broken at some point, um, probably in a fight. More ribs, you can see a piece of, of um, this is a, you know, I won't call it seaweed, but it's a, a water weed. And here we have part of the humerus on the right and carpal bones of all things on the left. Now, why a humerus is laying on top of a foot, I don't know, but that's what it was. Here we see oh, the unit cut down to where these bones are. These are all rib bones, except the one um, is a knuckle bone actually. And we can see a Phragmites root inside one of the ribs, and it has actually broken it. Now, Phragmites is not well liked by geologists. This is really, really cool. This, it, you look at the little spots, the round spots, those are depressions cut by a canid, um, a, a tooth uh, from a, a young young wolf, a large coyote, or was it dogs? Um, domestic dogs, we don't know, but it's fascinating. And you'll see that little implement that whoever it is is digging with is actually a piece of bamboo that is used for, it's not gonna be hard enough to scrape anything or damage anything. And if you have, something delicate, you want to use something like that. You'll see the clippers there to cut the roots from the Phragmites. And here again, you'll see the, um, this is the humor, part of the humerus and 
You see the size by the trowel. And you try to keep these things wet and you're putting water on them every eight so or so minutes, but it doesn't always work. And if they dry out, they, they fall apart. And here we see Dennis Vesper and Glenn with the book, uh, looking at whatever's being dug there. And here they're keying out one of the carpal bones in a book. And again, we see them keying out exactly what bone, what bone it is. And this is in situ and, and uh, the way it should be. And these are carpal bones. Now, stuff that's brought out of the, the, the units uh, has to be sieved. Now you've gone through this earth with a fine tooth comb. You don't think there's anything there, but it still needs to be sifted. This mesh is eighth of an inch mesh. So anything larger than an eighth of an inch is going to be left. Well, it's not really easy to get mud through, but you have to do it. And this is why you do it in where the trench was, where the ditch, and this was mechanically done. Anything in there is not in situ. It's not the way it was. So you, you just slop this slop into a bucket and you take it over to the sieve and you go through it and you label it as in such and such section of that ditch. You don't know where with it had been, but Tom, um, this you and I did. This is really fun because this is the shoulder blade from that animal. And here we can see the shoulder blade again. And again, what was interesting about this is that we see where a stone ax has been used to whack it. Now, we had not found, anybody had not found a place that a mastodon had been butchered. Um, in any part of eastern New York state. So this was very, very exciting. And the minute this was found, it went from Gramley's excavation as a paleontological dig, it was his. It went over to Dennis Vesper's dig once it became an archaeological dig uh, instantly. And it, that, that changeover was you know, flawless and quick because he was on site. And here again, you see the shoulder blade. And here we have a long bone that had been whacked with a hammer stone. A divot had been taken out. That flake was never found, but um, the interesting thing is you can see here where it was hit, how it was hit, and what, with what force it was hit to knock it out. This is a photo of a mammoth flake that was struck the same way. This was from South Dakota. And dimensionally, it was the same. So they were using these things some way uh, though we did not find the one from the Bowser Road site, this one was in South Dakota from a mammoth as opposed to a mastodon, but it's the same thing, probably used for the same purpose. And we don't know what that is. But here again, we see where a stone ax has been used and has actually been cut into the bone. And what's interesting about it is that bone that is fresh, each one of those little holes in the bone is full of a, a gelatin-like substance. And if it's real fresh, it will smear as it's being hit. And we have that smearing and then mineralization over the top of that smearing. So we know the bone was struck by something sharp within a week of that, the death of that animal. And uh, we have butcher marks. 
And here again, we see the same thing. We see the smearing, we see the cuts, we see two blows. Um, and with an electron microscope, you can actually see the, the fluids in the stone ax where it was, um, where they had made this ax. And it's incredible, so you know exactly what it was. This is interesting in that it is a piece of mastodon tusk, but not from that same animal. It was found in a circular pile of, I'll call them tools. Uh, it was 35 centimeters in diameter. And this particular piece was a used up scraper. And apparently when this band found or killed or whatever, this mastodon, they had fresh material and they could dump the decades old stuff that they had been using right along. So they had new material and this was dumped. And this was also found on that same dump site. This to me is a beveled edge. Um, to my grandmother, he thinks it's more of a, a wedge, whatever it's used for cutting. It was, this was manufactured by people and we see it cleaned up here and we can see how they did it, how they made it, um, what its shape was. It's spectacular. Uh, here's the long bones being held by my family. <laughs> Just a piece of bone, so you can give an idea how big these things are. Well, we knew that the animal had died in a lake, whether it was killed or whether it died, we don't know. Um, but if it's in a lake, there has to be shoreline. And if there's a shore, there should be a beach. So we laid out this line and went back. And every 10 feet, we made a new hole, uh, probe for beach sand. And here we find beach sand. Now this was about 15 or 20 feet from the actual edge of the water line, but we have it. We know where it is. So what do you do? You dig it. And here you see where these people are, uh, beach sand. And you have the beach that was there. Uh, this area had been a lake of about a mile long, about half mile wide, very shallow. Uh, the mastodon from where that beach is, we estimated that the depth was about three and a half feet deep uh, where the, the animal died. And here's a tooth that came up. Um, this one actually is from a different site. This is one that was given to me to restore. People had put it, they had found it in Circleville, New York, uh, in Orange County, and had been worried that the state would take it away from them. And that's not the case. It found on their farm, it's theirs. And so I restored it for them uh, with material that was given to me by the New York State Museum as a relation, uh, public relations work. And this is what, it, once I'd stabilized it, what it looked like and could be then they can put on their mantle as opposed to in their sock closet. Other bones that I'd worked on, um, this one happened to be at Museum Village in Monroe, New York, um, was came out about a hundred years ago or a little over and they had homemade varnish and shellac and various and sundry other things and paint. Um, so we had to take all that off and get it to the point that if we wanted to do study on the chemistry of it, we could. And so this is what it looked like when I got finished with it. And the stuff I'm using here is um, a consolidant that um, can be reversed. You can pull this back out and you have no chemistry left and then put it back on when you're finished. This is what looks like the, one of the things at the museum. And uh, this is what I was using to clean them. And the rest of these are before and after pictures mostly. Um, and this is what it looks like after and again before. 
this was a part of an upper palate. One of the reasons I ended up at the museum was this particular piece. Um, we're working on it here. This is what it looked like. And this is what it looked like clean. And I haven't cleaned it all. And you can see at the very bottom is still. And this again is another piece of homemade varnish that had been put on and um, taking that slowly off, dissolving it and getting it out of the bone. This is what a kneecap of a mastodon looked like. So if you ever want to know what a kneecap of a mastodon, well, there it is. And at the museum, this piece was found in, well, we're not sure exactly when, um, but it was, they had not really destroyed it. They had put some stuff on it, but it wasn't bad. But I thought maybe it would be nice to have a thing to show what the matrix was and what the bone inside of that matrix would look like. This is what it looked like once we finished. Uh, we left the matrix on the inside. I did clean it up or pretty good around the edges, but you can see that the matrix was still there. And this is part of that upper palette on the inside. If you think of a mastodon skull, how heavy that would be with the tusks, the animal could not hold its head up. So nature in its way has fixed that by making what looks like, uh, almost like a, a honeycomb. And each one of those has a gelatin-like substance in it. And it makes the skull much lighter. It's extremely strong because of, the, of that honeycomb-like stuff. But down below, you will see where, and I left the matrix of sand with it. Uh, you will see where the tusk cavity had been. And in that tusk cavity, we have pieces of tusk. And I just thought that was so cool. And sometimes, you know, because it was completely buried by sand. I was just working when, lo and behold, found tusk. That's just really cool. And here is, I would like to thank the people who participated over the years in excavation and preservation of Macedon in Orange County. They have provided knowledge and artifacts that we have today. I would like to especially thank the staff of the New York State Museum who participated in them and those who participated in the Basel Road excavation and the incorporated chapter of Orange County, New York State Archaeological Association. So that's, that's, that's that. <laughs>